So thank you so much for doing this with me today, and I, I love having you back. Oh, it's good to see you. Sure, and for, uh, for everyone who doesn't know, I'm Patrick Teen, LICSW, and this is Amanda Curtin, LICSW. She developed a very powerful intimacy tool called the 123 process, and we're gonna uh, just get into the whole process in this video, and I, what I would really love to know about it is how you came up with it. Like, sure. I'm just thinking about a clinician's uh, or a therapist kind of journey and sort of a, I'm assuming it was sort of like you were stuck and needed something and how did it all come about? The way it came about was um, my husband and I went on our first vacation together mm -hmm. and we both got triggered by each other. Oh wow. And for some reason, I don't know why, we mm -hmm. said let's keep fighting until we break up or get to a different place. Good plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I most of the way through thought we're gonna break up but yeah. we hung in there, uh -huh. and by the end of it, I looked at him, and really for the first time in my life, I felt like we resolved the bump in the present, whatever we were fighting about, wow. um, and I felt closer to him. And wow. so then we went back and tried to figure out, well, what was it that got us to this place? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's the challenge of intimacy, trying to figure out how to deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. I would say most people either have the same fight over and over again, yeah. or they just begin to live parallel lives and they don't fight, but they yeah. don't deal with stuff, um, mm -hmm. or they break up. And so I wanted to find a tool that would help people uh, experience what I experienced with my husband. Cool. And because I do a lot of couples work in group, uh, people get triggered. They get triggered by mm -hmm. something in the present, and I call that the bump. Yeah. And then uh, the bump, triggers us to something in the past which connects with what I call our well of pain. It's all the unresolved feeling that we couldn't express in childhood and even later as adults. Mm -hmm. And so um, I can tell you the red flags of triggering because I think if you're going to do the, the one, two, three, you have to be aware when you're triggered. Sure. So the first one is you have a huge reaction to something. Right. And part of you kind of gets, it might be too big, and part of you feels like it feels right. Right. But, um, and uh, the second one is a harder one for most people to realize. It's when you shut down. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple come in, and one of them is just furious and, you know, letting the other one have it. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the partner is just sitting there quietly, and they look fine, but they're gone. <laughs> They've left right. emotionally. Right. Um, the third trigger is, uh, red flag, is that I really look at language. Um, so mm -hmm. all or nothing thinking, kids are all or nothing thinkers, like mm -hmm. you always do this, I never do this. Mm -hmm. um, or um, metaphors, because kids are very visual and use metaphors, so mm -hmm. when I hear language like you just abandoned me, or I feel like you just stabbed me in the heart, right. they're probably You're triggered. like a runaway train exactly. or a loose cannon or exactly. something. Exactly, yeah. yep, yeah. exactly. One of my favorite ones is when you stop liking the person who triggered you. Um, when I'm mm -hmm. triggered by my husband, I'm like, why am I with him? <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's awful. Uh, and then when I come right. out of my trigger, there he is, you know, and I love him. Sure. But um, that's, that's a really important one. Yeah. Um, another red flag would be the feeling of righteousness. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm right and you are so wrong. Yep. And I think the here's, here's why. Yes, and here's why. <laughs> I've got all the reasons. Um, I, think, I think that the reason that happens is because when we're triggered back to childhood, we are innocent. We are righteous. But mm. in the present, we usually have something to do with the bump that's happening. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then the final red flag would be when you feel like using your favorite coping strategy. You know, mm -hmm. you want to eat something, you want to go on the computer, you want to have a drink, whatever. Mm -hmm. Keep busy, whatever we do to, to cope. Right. And so the, the one, two, three obviously has three steps. One, yep. two, three. Um, and the first one is just when you recognize that you're triggered. Um, and I, the first thing I will say to people is don't use it as a weapon. Don't say to the other person, I think you're triggered, because yeah. it doesn't ever work. Um, you right. have to come saying, I think I'm triggered, and I'd love to have a process with you. Mm -hmm. And then the first step is to try to figure out what you got triggered back to. Sometimes it's immediate, like the yeah. look you gave me, my father would give me all the time. Mm -hmm. But I would say most of the time people don't think it's, they can't figure it out. And sure. they'll say, I'm not really triggered. You know, I don't think it's taking me back to anything. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be willing to do some detective work. And that's where I think people who use this 
I want them to share their childhood histories. I mean, some couples know it, some group members know it, but you really need to know somebody's history. Totally, yeah. So that when you're triggered, you know, sometimes when I'm triggered, my husband will say, you know, that really reminds me of when you were a little girl, you know, at three, you told me this scene. And it's like, yes, totally, but I wouldn't have got, gotten there on my own. Right. And so you have to ask those questions like, what are you feeling right now? What are you thinking? When might you have felt that as a kid? Or thought that as a kid mm -hmm. and one of the lately I've been looking um, looking at a lot of attachment theory and how sure. you know when we're kids we need to feel emotionally attached to a parent mm -hmm. and that means that you feel safe that you feel like they're a resource to you mm -hmm. that you affect them yeah that they unconditionally love you mm -hmm. they have your back yeah those are all kind of basic things mm -hmm. and so if I ask people in the present like what are you feeling right now about the other person? It'll often come down to that. Like, I feel like you don't really like me. You know, I, I feel like right now you, you don't feel safe to me. Or I don't affect you. Or, mm. you know, all those things, you know, that are sort of basic um, experiences for children. Then if I say, oh, you know, you don't feel safe with this person. Did you feel safe growing up? Well, not really with my father, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's a way to, it, it right. really is detective work. Right. And it's so hard for the person to even think back to those early years. And yes. so there can be a lot of like kind yes. of meandering through and figuring it out. Or just thinking about who, what kind of parent were they? Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. If they were massively depressed or alcoholic, yes. they may have not even been able to sort of attach with anybody. Yes. And that's who you had. And most of us had some issue uh, attaching emotionally. I don't think many families know how to deal in a healthy way with, with emotions. Right. So most people carry some kind of attachment wound mm -hmm. and um, some more than others. But mm -hmm. um, And so trying to find where you go back to is critical and you have to wait until the person goes, yes, that really rings true to me. And sometimes it's frustrating because yeah. that's why um, one of the things I didn't say earlier is I think when you do the one, two, three initially, you need to have somebody moderate it. Mm -hmm. Over time, you'll be able to do it on your own and also have a shorthand. But in the beginning, with two triggered people, it's really hard to, yeah. to, to do this process. Right. So I teach it to people and then eventually they use it on their own. Got it. So Got once, it. So once you've figured out, this is the first half of the first step, once you've figured yeah. out where you've gone back to, mm -hmm. then you have to release some emotion around it mm. and not just stay in your head. Yeah, I know that was my father. He was really shaming about, you know, how I looked or maybe thought my mother thought I was, you know, lazy all the time. Right. But, but it's in my head. I still have all this mo emotion that's gotten triggered. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are a number of ways that I've learned that people can release that emotion. And the first one is to just tell the story to just talk about what happened. And what happens is you start to talk about it and you start to feel it, and the person who triggered you starts to feel it, mm -hmm. and you start to have a connection. Wow, that's really, really scary what you went through. Yeah. Or I can really see why you feel shame about that. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way. Mm -hmm. um, the second way is to put the person who triggered you, maybe the parent who triggered you, in an empty chair and have you say something to them. Mm -hmm. And that's a scary one for most people. They don't want to do it. Um, right. But what I found is over time, they start to realize how helpful it is to right. be able to, in a safe way, you're not talking to your real parent, you know, you're doing it in a safe way. Um, it just feels good to finally say, you know, I'm really sad that you were so unavailable to me. Wow. I really needed you. So you, you'll be working with a couple, mm -hmm. and they're triggered, and you're in this first or a step. Group in, or a group. Or a group, yeah. right. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. just like an intimate couple. Yeah. It's just an intimacy tool. Yeah. And when two people are exploring where they go back to in childhood, mm -hmm. there really needs to be like a heartfelt connection yes. to what happened for that person. Yeah. So you bring in the bad parent, mm -hmm. and you put them in an empty mm -hmm. chair, and then you do you let the partner or the other person talk to the parent or the person who was abused by that parent? Uh, both. Usually I'll ask, I'll see if the person whose childhood it was can do it, but sometimes they're really shut down and right. I'll ask the other person to do it, which can be a, a huge emotional connection. Very validating. Um, it's, it's beautiful and yeah. it surprises people how the feelings come up. 
mm-hmm. you know, especially uh, people who have learned to shut down their feelings. There's something mm-hmm. about putting, and, and, and people will tell me they literally start to see the parent in the chair, mm-hmm. and they're starting to talk to them. Right. And so it's a, it's a very powerful healing experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that's one. Um, Would you ask, sometimes when I've done it, I've asked, when you do like an empty chair piece, sometimes I will ask when it's their parent, I might ask that person, what would your parent be saying right now? Mm-hmm. What would their body yeah. language be like? Yeah. Could they tolerate this or yeah. something? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And Or they might even hear the parent saying, this is really stupid what you're doing right now. Right. You know, you must feel really ridiculous. And yeah. so just knowing what the block is can be helpful. Got it. Um, but it's it's a powerful emotional experience. And mm-hmm. the, the thing that is so critical about step one is you come into step one pretty upset with the person who triggered you. And you want to mm-hmm. talk about that present piece. Like you want to have a couple rounds. And my job as the moderator is to say, we're not going to talk about the present bump right now very hard for some people yeah and they keep trying to do it and I'll just say you know we'll get there but right now we're gonna talk about what happened I was gonna ask you about that Mm because I find that the hardest piece about it was these people are really pissed off at each other you know what I mean and then with that the exercise is is to try to put that away for now and connect from a hard space so you could be really triggered by your partner and now you have to shift and talk about that partner's childhood and what happened to them absolutely very hard very hard Mm -hmm. Um, what helps the process is that when you really stop and pay attention to what your partner or the other group member, what they suffered as a kid, your heart opens. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to me. Somebody yeah. will be just like, I don't, you know, let's say a group member has been triggered by somebody. I don't want to be in this group with this person anymore. Right. I just don't like them. I don't think they're, it's a good fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we do the one, two, three, when they start to hear where their where this group member went back to, it's just how could you not open your heart, and how could you not even understand mm. why they had the reaction they did, mm-hmm. um, and so it's a very connecting experience, um, and it's it's easier than most people think. It just you just have to pay attention and really figure out where the person went back to, and open your heart. It just right. it just happens. Um, another another way uh, I found people. Uh, can do step one is is emotionally is to write out on a piece of paper um, what they want to say to the person in the present like that yeah. unedited it's really yeah. nasty um, just put it all on paper right and then look at it and think who do I really want to say this to mm-hmm. and so that's another way and the other way to emotionally connect is for the person to talk to the other person's inner child so for example if um, if I, if I was brought up to believe I was really stupid and I go back to that place where, you know, I, was, I didn't do well in school yeah. because maybe I didn't get enough support at home and mm-hmm. it just, just, or I was told I was stupid from time to time if I made a mistake, I was stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, at the dinner table, I was the youngest in the family, so everybody else seemed to be smarter than I was, even though I was just younger. Um, mm-hmm. I, can, I asked the, the person who um, triggered them to talk directly to the inner child and tell them the truth. To say, you know what, you were really smart. You just got told you were dumb. Mm -hmm. And I see how smart you are. And I want, I look back and see that, that this was done to you. And I'm so, so sorry that you, that you really believe that you were, that you weren't smart when, when really it was how your parents were treating you. And again, another connective moment. They're getting some healthy parenting yes. from the person that they were prior really upset with. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So, so one person does that, mm-hmm. and then we do the whole process, step one, with the other person. Mm-hmm. They have to figure out where they got triggered to, because one of the things I found is if one person is triggered in a relationship, the other one gets triggered right away. So we've got two triggered people, so mm-hmm. we take turns doing yeah. step one. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that's step one. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so mm-hmm. so the, the second step is really important um, for the inner child. And what you have to do is think about um, the person who triggered you mm-hmm. and how they're different than the person you got triggered to in childhood. Right. And the reason that you have to do that is because you may now say, okay, I got triggered back to my father. You're just like them. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be able to say, 
okay, what's the evidence that the person in the present is different? Yeah. Now, so in my groups, it's really easy because people will say, well, my parents would never be sitting in this room doing this work, and mm -hmm. you really are doing it. Right. And you're willing to have a process with me that my parents would never do. Right. Um, sometimes it's good to look at specifically what the trigger was. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you feel like the person um, who triggered you uh, didn't acknowledge your, your pain at the time or didn't acknowledge, no, really didn't acknowledge their part in the bum, mm -hmm. um, realizing that this person has apologized and owned things in the past, whereas your parent never did, is again, mm -hmm. kind of, oh yeah, they're different. They're different than my parent. Right. And that can also be an incredibly connective moment where people are starting to see. It, sometimes it becomes almost a little bit of a love fest where people say, you know, you're always so sweet, you know, and I, right. I feel so safe with you most of the time. Um, I didn't feel that safe growing up. Yeah. Or they're seeing the person for the first time. Yes, exactly. Because right. mm -hmm. I find that when um, that second piece rolls around, there can be kind of an awakening where the person yeah. does really starts to learn how they are with people yeah. like like they might say oh my god I, i'm really i tend to be really hard on people yes you know yes. and they can then from there maybe get out of their own way a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it, it's just again thinking i try to have people make sure that they're saying how the person is different around the issue of the trigger mm -hmm. so um you know if somebody uh let you down let's say they said they were going to call you and they didn't call you when they said they would and you feel like really, really hurt by that. Um, yeah. To remember the times when they have called back and to see this as a bump versus a mm -hmm. habitual pattern, whereas as a kid, maybe you felt let down a lot and hurt by, not, by a parent not responding. Mm -hmm. and so, it's, so we do that. With the one, two, three, one of the difficulties is at any point you can get re-triggered again. And so, you know, yeah. if that happens, you have to kind of deal with that and right. and, and not ignore it. So And I, go back to the first part? And go back to the it's first like part. It's like shoots and ladders. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <Zoom. laughs> That's totally true. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but you have to be aware that, for example, I was working with a, with a couple once, and when we got to step two, mm -hmm. and I said, okay, how is your partner different? The person kind of paused, thought for a little bit, and said, I don't think they really are. And it just triggered the yeah, other person, like, right. what? <laughs> you know? right. And so, you know, but again, usually when people do this, they usually are coming wanting, in a way, to get to the other side. And so mm -hmm. they're willing to work with this. And, and I just have to, you can usually very quickly say, you know, that's kind of a trigger. Let's look at what it takes you back to and kind of come back to step two. Got it. Or I know them and I can say, you know, I think they're different this way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They might need some help. <laughs> right. They might need some help. Right. Yeah. So there, there's... I'm assuming that, that the second part, I know it is like really kind of addressing some reality testing mm -hmm. and some projection. Yes, exactly. Like some, yes. we're looking to recreate, not recreate, but reconfirm our childhood experiences. Yes. So when it's like, you're just like my dad. Yes. yes. That's a strong, powerful yes. statement of projection. It is. And it, the problem is it can feel right for, sure. from the inner child point of view. And so it, I want some evidence. I want them not to just say, oh, they're different. I know they're different. No, in concrete ways. How is this person different right. than the person who triggered you? And that is hard. Let's just say the parents get triggered to an alcoholic parent and their mm -hmm. partner has a drinking problem. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So there's yeah. going to be, yep. I find when I do it, people can get really caught up yes. in the concrete parts yes. of it. But some of it, you know what I mean, yes. it's, it's stuff yes. to navigate. Well, and another thing you can say that's a difference is um, I'm not a powerless child anymore. Absolutely. And right. um, we're both adults. That's right. a big difference. Right. You didn't really cause what happened to me as a kid. Mm -hmm. That's another difference. Mm -hmm. So, um, or you're, as I said, the, the big one is you're doing this process with me. Right. And that's pretty amazing. Right. Yeah. So that's step two. Mm -hmm. Step three is interesting. You finally get to talk about the present piece. And a lot of people have, have assumed that the one, two, three is only about the past and we just take everything back. But mm -hmm. the present bump is often really important. Right. You know, we are imperfect beings and we have patterns of behavior that don't work in relationships. So this is a chance to address it. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes with step three, it really is not a big deal and, and to address the present piece. And people will say, I'm fine. Now that I see where I got triggered to and where you got triggered to, I feel pretty good. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, there's some kind of a present piece. And so the first thing I ask people to do is to think about what their part was. How mm -hmm. did I contribute? What can I own about this? Right. And 
it's huge because we often come from families where nobody owned anything. Yeah. So for example, I might say, you know, I really was sarcastic when I, when I talked to you, or I didn't call you back when I said I would. Mm -hmm. um, or I have kind of a pattern of dominating conversation sometimes, so I, I recognize I think I did that. And I can't, mm -hmm. what a relief to have somebody own it. It feels, what, what clients discover, which really surprises them, is that owning stuff feels good. Yeah. It's amazing. It's really amazing. It's like, it's such a freedom. Yeah, I don't right. have to be a perfect person. Right. And hearing somebody own something can feel so good, too. Right. Makes me think of, like, our families that are more focused on winning the argument. Yes. As yes. opposed to really kind of like, you know, yes. most of our families, I mean, like, you know, even my own, if you owned something that felt like you were going to die, yes. if you admitted fault yes. or you had a part to play in anything. Or know. that you were bad. Right. You know, going right into the shame. So, yep. so that's a huge part of, mm -hmm. of um, the process. And then I ask people, what do you need in order to resolve it? Mm. And sometimes that's really hard because most people haven't really taken the time to, or, or weren't really encouraged to think about what they needed. So they have to stop and think about it. What do I really need? Mm -hmm. They could need an apology. They could need a clarification. What did you mean when you said that? Mm -hmm. um, or they could, uh, they could need something to change in the relationship. So for example, um, with, mm. a, uh, with a couple, you might have somebody say, you know, I think you make most of the decisions around where we go out to eat. And I think we should practice taking turns. Mm -hmm. And so I might set up a, pro what I, I do programs with people, meaning that if you're going to change a behavior, you need to do it in a repetitive way for a while. I usually mm -hmm. tell people 28 days, you know, something like that. Yeah. And so, so I might say to the couple, for the next 28 days, I want you to take turns choosing where you're going to go eat and see what that feels like. Yeah. And because we have, uh, in relationship, we get into patterns of rigid behavior oftentimes, mm -hmm. the same thing happening over and over again, it forces the uh, people to think about, okay, what would be a better way of dealing with this issue? Yep. Another example was a, a couple where um, the husband tended to be the one who set limits and the wife tended to be the one who was sort of lenient around it. And so they decided for 28 days they were going to switch roles and see what, oh, wow. what happened. And it really, it really shifted things. So that by the end of it, they felt mm. like they both could do it. You know, they could both set limits and they could both at times say, oh, let's be a little lenient here. Do you mean with their parenting of the actual children? With, their, or with actually parenting their children. Got yes. it. Yes. Wow. What if that bump is initially like, because, you know, what you just described was sort of like life, life stuff. And um, there's, there's a lot more emotional kind of stuff mm -hmm. going on with the triggering. Mm -hmm. But what if that third part is something like, I need you to respect me? Do you know what yes. I mean? Like if it yes. comes down to like yes. basic things yes. missing in the relationship. I think the problem with, with that general kind of request is you don't really know what they mean or can really know if they do it. Like what would respecting me mean? Like it might be when you come home, I want you to greet me. <laughs> Yeah. at the door and yeah. say, I'm really happy to see you. Right. Um, if I have an opinion, I want you to listen to it and maybe sit with it for a bit before you give your opinion. So you have to make it concrete. Right. Or return my text. Yes. Just yes. even if you're not really yes. feeling good about what yes. I just said or something. Perfect. Right. That's a great example. Right. Because the other thing is that um, a lot of us came from families where people said they were sorry, but the behavior never changed. Yeah. And so, for example, in a group uh, recently, mm -hmm. I had a person who was very upset that, that, and this was pretty much a pattern, that when she called another group member, because mm -hmm. um, you're allowed to in my group have contact, yep. um, uh, she rarely got a call back. Mm -hmm. And so when we got to the step three, um, she realized that she'd really lost trust with this person. And so to build the trust, the other person agreed to um, ha have the person who was calling would call once a week and the person who never called back would would call back within an hour and it was huge wow. it totally changed uh, their relationship and slowly built some trust mm -hmm. so it has to be right you have to see something different and it has to be something kind of really like it sounds like um, specific very specific or, right, explicit yes. like right so that you can know if it's being done or not right like I want I want you to love me I don't know what that means. Yeah. You know, I right. have to figure out what that means. Maybe it right. means more hugs. Maybe it means that mm -hmm. you know there there's more time that there's more time for the person. Um, wow. So yeah. yeah.
it's always trying trying to negotiate that. And Very each person, cool. each person again has a chance to um, to do that part of step th of step three to to ask for what they need mm -hmm. around it. Which do you, which part is the hardest part? Do you think? <laughs> uh, I think step one, mm. and I I think the second. The, sorry, the first part of step one is the hardest because it's when you're triggered for some reason, and I include myself, mm -hmm. I do not want to uh, believe that I'm triggered. I want it to be about the present. And totally. I developed this. So, you know, if right. I'm saying it's hard, it's hard. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, yeah. my, my husband will tell you, it's just, it's just for, I don't know why, but it's just hard to think, wait yeah. a minute, this is really taking me back. Right. Yeah. I had this client that said something brilliant one time when we were talking about being triggered. No one likes to admit that we're, when we're triggered. Yeah. Not only that, you're absolutely right. We, yeah. Then we don't want to sort of, you know, especially if the partner really did something really actively yeah. triggering that yeah. we don't want to be triggered in yeah. that or something. Yeah. Uh, um, and this client said we need to de-trigger the idea of being triggered. There you go. You know? Perfect. Because people think it's bad or people think it's like I'm out of control if yes. I'm triggered. Yes. Where we're, you know, people are triggered all the time. Or there's small ways and big ways, you know. I often get this which is um but but there was a really big problem in the present. You're just denying that there's a problem. Absolutely. This is really big. Right. And you know, what I'll say is we'll get there. Step three we'll right. get there. But if you take the triggering energy off of the present, right. The 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 present bump when you get to step three, it's right sized, yeah, and it's much more workable. Yeah, um, and you know, but it, it is really hard to stop mm -hmm. in the middle of all this emotion and be able to think, what what is it taking me back to? Especially if it's not immediate to you, right? Yeah. The well, other thing I found about the one two three is I. I used to call it a conflict resolution tool, and mm -hmm. I do initially when I'm introducing it to people, mm -hmm. but now I call it an intimacy tool. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when you do this is you get to know yourself much better, mm -hmm. and you get to know the other person much better. And so it's a, there's, a, there's a moment of intimacy with yourself and with the other person yeah. that's really amazing. And people, when, when people start to really use this and they get more familiar with it and comfortable with it, Mm -hmm. It it really does become less about conflict and much mm -hmm. more about just understanding what just happened. Why did I say what I said, and why did you behave the way you did? I want to figure that out because once you do, there's a, you, you totally understand it. Like I understand why I didn't want to talk about that, yeah. and I understand why you shut down when I said that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Uh, one last question because I'm thinking that. Um, this is the most powerful tool that I use in my practice. Mm -hmm. This is sort of, I've never known something else that really connects people, but also gets gets them both out of their mm -hmm. own way and mm -hmm. out of the way of the relationship. Yeah. But do you have any tips? Because um, many people, um, if they can't see me, they say they did a one, two, three on their own. Yes. Do you have any tips on when people are doing that without a moderator? Yeah, it's hard. One of the great things that has happened with my groups is that people will, um, after they get to know this a little bit, they will mm -hmm. do. They will call a group member to moderate the one, two, three, Beautiful. which is right. amazing. And that what they find is, it's so much easier um, to mm -hmm. to do than they thought to be a moderator. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons I teach this in in a couples group versus often just with a couple alone, mm -hmm. is that when you're watching another couple do a one, two, three, it makes total sense. You yeah. can see it so clearly, mm -hmm. but the couple on the hot seat, they can't see it. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. It feels so confusing and emotional and hard, yeah, so right. it is helpful. Um, the thing that, that I do want people to try it outside, because then they come in with questions like, where did you get stuck? And I can help them. Right. Um, right. And over time, you don't have to do a, a full one, two, three. P couples who have used this will say, oh, yeah, there's that safety <laughs> trigger for me yeah. and I already know where I've gone. Right. And so it kind of takes the pressure off and we can deal with the present one um, much quicker. Very cool. Yeah. So maybe maybe a person that knows the couple well and or well enough yes. and Could. that they can maybe be sort of like a, almost like a neutral kind of yes. little thing they can maybe yeah. do like I because yeah. the 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 word doc or what you have the one two three laid out is very explicit mm -hmm. do you know what i mean it's very like sort of guides the people you yeah. know through and i'll, I'll have that uh, available in the video that people can kind of pull out yes 
that they can kind of see it and do it. And, and people often do have that in front of them, like, okay, right. where are we on this? Um, right. Yeah. I tell people that they really, they both, what's hard about it, I think I, I agree with you, the first part is probably the hardest part, that both people kind of have to be willing and that the other person isn't dragged into it. Yeah. So I always find that that's going to not really go well because yeah. some people might be like, well, fine, we'll talk about your childhood and maybe get through something. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, totally. So just basically, um, I find that two people kind of have to be willing and open-minded enough to do it. Yes. That makes it for yes. a really successful one. Yes. And the other piece is I think it's really helpful that there to be some shared knowledge of each other's childhood. Mm -hmm because you will really put somebody on the spot about what does it take you back to, and if yes. they've never really thought about it or don't, or it's like their brain doesn't really kind of think like that, yeah. it can be really kind of messy. Yeah, no, and I think that for a lot of us, we've never really challenged any of the ways we think about our childhood, so if it's a new thing, yeah, um, that's hard, and mm -hmm. it's emotional, you know? Right. You're going back to some pain. Uh, but I think that, so this is, for people you're close to, for people who are probably on a path of healing totally. um, yeah. and are willing. Absolutely. You can't just bust it out with your toxic boss. Yeah. No. <laughs> the, the way people say, well, what do I do with people who aren't safe for me? Yeah. And I'll tell them, do one yourself. So that if, let's say I have a toxic boss, mm -hmm. I can figure out where that boss is triggering me without telling him. Mm -hmm. And I can go back and figure out how it's different, which is that I can... Um, I'm an adult now and I can leave this job if I want or I can speak up or mm -hmm. go to HR or whatever. Um, right. And then, uh, so it, it's it, it's empowering. Right. Um, to, and it's to a one-sided one, two, it's three. It's a one-sided one, two, three. Yeah. And I think we are triggered a lot, so to be able to mm -hmm. have that helps us uh, really be better in the present and take care of ourselves in a better way. Right. And to not be so triggered and not to be so reactive with other people. Yes. yes. To have some control. Absolutely. Yes. Cool. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this with thank me. Thank you, Patrick. We'll have you back next time for something else. That'd be great. And it's so helpful. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome.